question, which was, seriously? They had to go to sleep? <laughs> They're on the moon? And it's like, like, and, and it's like, and lie down those now. Those <laughs> engineers took out the seats in the Apollo 11 lander. So they were just like sleeping on the floor. Oh, really? The oh, later yeah. ones, they put a hammock in, but huh. still, in order to save weight, they got rid of the huh. seats. I so they're laying and standing up. It's, it's, inter- <laughs> it's interesting to fly the, the lunar module. So I've actually got um, some some stick time in our uh, simulator for the lunar module. Jeff, you flew yes. it? Yes. So I, I actually got... <laughs> I actually got to quote land on the moon with both both Rusty Schweikert and Charlie Duke, who were both uh, Apollo uh, lunar module pilots. No kidding. And uh, <laughs> you're standing up. You're flying the thing. You, you know there is no seat. You're just standing <laughs> up and you know bringing the thing in and flying it. And of course, both those guys are, are you know crack, crackerjack at it because you know they flew the real thing. Right. Yeah. Uh, right. They're both. They were both still very good at it and you know much better than us. But. Just that experience of what's what's it really like to try and go fly and land on the moon? It's it's not like flying an airplane. It's not like flying a helicopter. It's a completely unique and different experience. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It has to be right. It's well, not and, the earth. And we're on the verge of having to relearn that all again for yeah. the new program. And we're smarter too. And like you said, we learned so much by right. you know Thanks to Apollo, some of the, right? the the videos of Buzz and um, and Neil jumping around the surface on Apollo Eleven. You'll see them. They're trying out different steps because they're trying to figure out how to walk in one sixth gravity. Uh-huh. With the bulky spaceship, right. so you see them the hopping seats, and yeah. all that. Yeah. So this that was also part of experiments right, as well. Right. Yeah, you know, we wanted to know right. how could we work and live in this environment. Right. It ter- turns out skipping. Breaking the answer. Skipping. The oh, really well. is that why you see them skipping? Yeah, yeah. That they look like they're yeah. having that, That's pretty much the most efficient <laughs> locomotion oh, on the earth. That's pretty skip cool. Along. That's great. Having to adapt in the moment and learn exactly. That's you know, what answering those questions that we did not know. Because you can only simulate so much. You have to go there. Yeah, and that's where you're going to make the big leaps in knowledge understanding. It's like. Smooth Master says, moving in those suits is insane. It must be, right? <laughs> yeah, and you got this big and, chunky thing. I'm like, look at it off your shoulder and all that. Yeah. And the lunar module is your favorite spacecraft? Is it's that, my favorite spacecraft to date. Yeah. Yes. Okay, well, then, <laughs> you, then I want you to know that Aperture Combined says, my grandfather helped with the design of the lunar module. Oh, my gosh. That's awesome. awesome. Lucky. That is but awesome. The, the thing I like, the, the reason the lunar module is my favorite is because, um, you know, it's it's... One of the few vehicles that we've ever built that is really designed only for the space environment. environment. Right? Yeah. It yeah. never has to go through an atmosphere. Oh, right. Yeah. Okay. Right? And so it doesn't, yeah. it doesn't look like a, an atmospheric right. vehicle. And, you know, the International Space Station is another example, but there's not very many that are like that. Almost everything else, either, you know, it's yeah. got to go up through an atmosphere or it's got to come back through an atmosphere. And so it's just a very distinctly different kind yeah. of vehicle. I, I really like them. Yeah. <laughs> I yeah. can see that. Yeah, for those of you who build spacecraft yeah. or right. design instruments for them, yeah, that matters. Very cool. So, one cool thing about celebrating the anniversary is that we've been gathering people's memories. And so I thought about what's my memory of Apollo fiftieth? Yeah. I wasn't born then, right. but it made me think. Oh my gosh, my dad had this videotape that he sat me and my sister down in front of. He popped it on the VCR. It was this weird, grainy, black and white footage. I didn't even know what it was. But it was the Apollo 11 moon landing. And at the time, I don't know, I was in elementary school or something. And I didn't get it. But mm-hmm. I knew that this mattered to my dad. He made us sit and watch it. He was and now I get it. To yeah. share it with you. It's yeah. so cool. Yeah, it That's cool. probably why you're here at NASA, too. Maybe. Maybe. Yeah. Just like, yeah. I don't know. And and now, it is, it now is, they can go watch it on the web. You know? yeah. Right. Yeah. 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 It was special but you, just, you know, try to think about just being back there and just, you know, it the was moment. a defining moment in history in that century. Yeah. For that, the world. Yeah. That just for the really? whole world. Yeah. Tuning yeah. in and watching this. I think that's amazing, right? Just in t- like everyone across the entire globe looking up at the moon, just mm-hmm. all at once. That's just amazing, right? Do you have some of those memories to share with us from? I do. So mm-hmm. we have uh, more stories, and they're actually from you all. Uh, we invited people all over the world to share their, share their Apollo 11 man- moon landing stories. And so we collected their responses, and um, they are part of our NASA Explorers Your Apollo Stories podcast. Um, and here's one we have here from um, Ellen in Calistoga, California. We are all glued to our television that day. Mind you, this is a television that only got three channels, so I'm grateful that we were able to watch. It was quite fuzzy, but it was so exciting. And me, being young, 
I immediately went outside with a pair of binoculars to stare at the moon to see if I could see Neil Armstrong walking on the moon. You know, when you're young, anything is possible. So nice. That's amazing. So if you all want to hear more stories like Ellen's, you can go to www.nasa.gov slash Apollo stories and browse through those. And now we have a whole bunch of questions waiting for yes. us. I think, should we jump to we should. our question section? Yeah. Do you want to... Do you want to lead us off into rapid fire question rapid time? Rapid fire, really, really quickly. Okay. Okay. So we have here from an Easter egg. Um, <laughs> I have a question. Why the moon before Mars? Well, I think there's a number of reasons. The, the biggest challenge with sending humans to Mars is that you know it's so much further away. It takes a lot longer to get there than going to the moon. Mm -hmm. um, and that duration introduces lots and lots of, of big problems, right? There's longer exposure to radiation, longer exposure to uh, really no gravity, mm -hmm. um, you know, living in a basically a tin can um, for potentially months, uh, mm -hmm. plus all of the technical um, devices and systems that have to be reliable enough to last that long. And rather than just Make a go of it and give it a sh give it your best shot. It's easier to prove all that out a little bit closer to home. You know, we've got a long period of having humans in Earth orbit on the space station. Um, the next big step is to go for that much further um, away from us and to spend that much more time. That takes us to the moon. And the Mars is a very different mindset as well. Right. You know, communication could be at much 20 mm -hmm. minutes, 30 minutes. So, so you're going to be very independent mm -hmm. when you're out there on your own yeah. doing space exploration. Um, here's one from Stinkfoot34. How much fuel did it take to lift the lunar module, the LEM, off the moon? You guys happen to know well, that? That's a good question. I don't I, know. I remember seeing the, the number for the the... LEM crew module, and I want to say, don't quote me on this, but I think More it was... More than zero. <laughs> <laughs> I, don't know. I think it was about, it, it was, you know, a few, let's say a few hundred gallons, right? It was not a huge, um, uh, not a huge amount, but it only had that one job to do. It had that one mm -hmm. job, and it, had, and, and it had to work that one time, right? Yeah. yeah. I, I know the number's published. I, I just don't have it at the tip of my tongue, but it's, there's, it's interesting. All the Apollo technical documents... Right, are out there. You can go online and download all the Apollo reports, all the experience reports, um, and like all those technical details, they're all in there. You can just go look them up. It's really yeah. cool to just browse through it. And you know, doesn't uh, everyone have the <laughs> Apollo technical <laughs> manual at home? I do. I, do. So. <laughs> I think that goes without saying. Full of fun <laughs> facts. You know, well, it's great to read over. <laughs> it's, know, on it's on my it's on my laptop in my office. Uh -huh. <laughs> nice. <laughs> um, there are some excited comments, like, can't wait to experience the same thing in five years as some did 50 years ago. That's right. We're the Artemis generation. We are the Artemis we generation. Missed Apollo we years. missed Apollo, but yeah. we're, we learn from Apollo. Uh -huh. We're building on the shoulders of Apollo. Yeah. Uh, we actually have a question. I think it's because we talk so much about the astronauts um, from It's Crazy K. What does it take to become an astronaut? Ooh, good question. And what did the astronauts have to do in order to land on the moon? Ed education, <laughs> um, skill, determination, um, a little luck, right? Luck. The, I think the last astronaut class had something like... 18,000 applicants. 18, of which I am one. Oh, no kidding. <laughs> but really? they only chose about, yeah. Uh, I want to be an astronaut when I grow up. Mm -hmm. I do. Yeah, someday. <laughs> um, but yeah, and our future astronauts for hu sustained uh, humans in space, you know, we're going to need all different types, you know, engineers and scientists, but we're going to need people who can keep machines working, you know, we're going to need plumbers, we're going to mm. need surveyors, we're going to need um, <laughs> folks who are can climb down, you know, canyon walls, spelunkers, yeah, you know, right. we're going to kind of, yeah. need all types of yeah. um, um, all kinds of <coughs> specialties. Here's a related question. Maybe this should be our last for now, but mm -hmm. we'll get back to more of your questions later. But Latio67 asks you, Kimberly, how long did you go to college to get the to get the knowledge for your current job? How well, did you get here? As I say, I stayed in school for a very long time. I did four years as an undergraduate. Um, got a physics degree. Physics is a great degree to learn how to solve problems. Mm -hmm. Then I did four years in grad school and I got a PhD in astrophysics. 
Um, and so, yeah, I stayed in school. And I remember um, when I got my first job, which was called a postdoc, is what you get after your doctorate, I went to another university, and my dad would call me up, are you still school, still in school? <laughs> <laughs> I said, no, I'm getting paid this time. <laughs> wow. So, yeah, so it was a, it was a good, um, good eight years of yeah. uh, schooling outside of high school. Mm-hmm. Right. It's like, well I think it's, worth it. Yeah. Well, right. <laughs> and, and it's important to recognize, too, right, that we never stop never learning. Stop learning. No. Never stop sure. learning. I mean, a job here working in the space business, sure. you never never stop learning. Yeah. In a good yeah. way, obviously. Yeah. I, mean, I think by the time you're doing your PhD, you're doing something you're passionate about. Yeah. And so you're loving it, right? I, I yeah. do think that um, school, for at least for me, school got even more fun and exciting mm-hmm. the more years of it I had. Yeah, uh, you know, yeah. I think back to like my freshman year of college, and it, it was a lot of work, and yeah. it was really challenging, and I mm-hmm. didn't know what I was doing. And as I spent more years in my academic career, it actually got easier and more fun. Mm-hmm. It didn't stop being challenging, yeah. but it, it became it took on a different note. So if you're if you're just starting in college, um, or if you're in high school, or even in elementary school, you know, it, it does get easier um, and I would argue it gets more fun as you as you go yeah. along so don't be afraid of spending lots of years right. in school yeah. right don't be intimidated <laughs> that's by that's a good years. point that's yeah. great excellent all right so we're going to get back to more questions later and before we move on I just want to let people know I want to invite you to join us in celebrating the 50th anniversary of the Apollo 11 moon landing and hear about our future plans to go to the moon and then on to Mars um, by tuning in to a special two hour live NASA television broadcast that's tomorrow at 10 a.m. Pacific so to learn about the show and how to watch you can go to www.nasa.gov slash Apollo 50th and click on events Yes. Are you yes. going to watch, Tiffany? Oh, definitely. Excellent. I will be watching. I'm actually excited. This stuff is really, really cool. It it's, really is. It's nice Thanks. to, you know, go back in time and revisit history and see that. You know what I mean? Absolutely. And so let's dig a little bit deeper into the Apollo history and talk about um, all of those those cool, cool facts that we don't know about. And, you know, in order to do that, we have our historian here, James. Hi, Tiffany. How are Hi. you? Hi. Tell us a little bit about yourself. Uh, so, my name is James Anderson, and I'm the NASA Ames historian. I've been here for a couple months, right in all the excitement leading up to Apollo. Good timing. Good timing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Jumped right in. Um, and the last few months have been uh, really wonderful. We've uh, had an opportunity to meet uh, a lot of Apollo-era veterans uh, who worked at Ames, That's and just cool. getting to hear um, even more stories um, from that time. Um, many of which, you know, are, are not the ones that uh, yeah, that you hear, you know, yeah. sort of all the time. They get yeah. told, yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So, what what do you know about that time at Ames? It was uh, an exciting time. Mm-hmm. Um, the during the the whole Apollo program, um, the the scope of the the number of people involved at its peak, there were around four hundred thousand. Uh, wow. Americans, men and women mm-hmm. from diverse backgrounds working uh, on uh, the Apollo project. Mm-hmm. Wow. Um, and here at Ames, there was also, uh, it was a time of building too. Uh, a number of new facilities uh, came online and got funding uh, at that time. Um, and a lot of that research um, directly influenced uh, the design uh, of Apollo. Wow. That, that, it's amazing, 400,000 people right. you know, all coming together, you know, this, to, to solve this ambitious and really get this, yeah. this, this plan going and this project going to get to the moon. It's amazing. Yeah, it was an incredibly huge yeah, effort. Yeah, that's a lot of effort. Yeah. yeah. What are some yeah. of the facilities that they were building to support the new missions? Well, uh, funny you should ask, I've brought some historical artifacts with me today. Oh, I like artifacts. <laughs> <laughs> uh, some of those uh, from our uh, facilities here at Ames. Uh, Kimberly was showing a little bit earlier uh, the model of the Apollo Command Module. I've got another kind of model of the Apollo Command Module. Oh. So you've got this Very one cool. here. What is this guy? It's just like it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, it's got, uh, it's got the exact same shape mm. of Apollo. And you notice one side is pointy and the other side not. Uh, why is that, Chad? <laughs> well, it's interesting. This is one of the unique contributions that Ames Research Center made to uh, not just the Apollo program, but to all of the the manned spaceflight programs of the time. Is uh, Harvey Allen was one of the, the aerodynamicists um, here at the center. He was later one of the center's uh, directors, and he was studying um, how to protect these vehicles um, from heat as they came back into the Earth's atmosphere, and 
previously, all the high-speed um, vehicles, they, they were very pointy, right? Sort of like the front end, you know, it had a sharp point because that was mm. the, the least amount of drag coming back into the atmosphere. Uh, but they got too hot. And Harvey Allen realized that if you went with this very blunt shape, um, it created a lot more drag and it would slow them down, but it allowed the heat to go out and around and it, the heat would not be transferred into the surface of the vehicle. So basically the, you know, the, the crew members in the vehicle um, would be protected from all that heat as, the, as it came back into the atmosphere. Yeah. And of course, we're, we're doing basically the same, the same concept today. So it was really a lasting contribution that he made. You can see that so with all the vehicles that are returning from the International Space Station, um, you know, and the commercial crew, mm -hmm. you know, the, the Boeing and the, mm -hmm. the, and the SpaceX capsules followed the same Just engineering the changing, common the design. shape of something, yeah. right? Yeah. The design and engineering of something. But how yeah. would you have come up with that shape? Right. You had to do a well, lot of testing. A, yeah. uh, he was uh, an eccentric uh, character, and it really is sort of um, the best ideas come from the eccentric yeah, characters. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, uh, Get the box. It's, 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 it's a really, it's an odd idea that turned out to work really well. And that concept, the blunt body concept, um, was developed. It's older than NASA itself. NASA mm. was founded in 1958, but Alan came up with that idea here at Ames uh, in the 50s when it was still part of uh, the NACA. Mm. Yeah, yeah. So Ames before it was NASA Ames. Yeah, Ames, yeah. yeah exactly. Ames yeah. before it was okay. NASA Ames. And, and solving a problem that was going to be not, you know, was going to be used decades later. Oh, yeah. You know? That's mm. incredible, too. A little forward thinking there. A lot of forward <laughs> Working but, on the future. James, what do you do with that model? What uh, is, is it solid metal? It is. Uh, and you launch them. All right. And one of the facilities uh, that was built, uh, construction began in 1964 mm -hmm. on what's uh, known as the hypervelocity free flight facility. Mm -hmm. And uh, it formally opened in 1965. And uh, this model, and I've got another one here. Oh. Um, this facility, imagine a tube. Okay. 75 feet long, three and a half feet in diameter. And from one end, you've got a really high uh, speed stream of air at one end. And then the other, you've got a cannon. Hmm. Oh. <laughs> a cannon. <laughs> so, <laughs> so uh, uh, what do we do with this cannon? Well, you shoot it. Oh. Yeah. Oh, makes sense. And the the projectiles. Projectiles. Oh. Yeah. And, the, and these uh, these projectiles, uh, they're they're made here in Ames's uh, machine shops, and this is another Apollo uh, model, uh, quite a bit smaller than the first one that we saw, but actually this one, it would be loaded uh, into um, the the cannon at one end, and. Uh, launched upstream into that air so that it's traveling really, really fast. Wow. Yeah, we, we, the we looked this up, and the, the facility has a top speed for that yeah. model of about 27,000 miles per hour. Whoa, for real? So it's wow. really moving. <laughs> wow. wow. Yeah. And it, it, it's really to reproduce the conditions um, of the capsule coming back into the Earth's atmosphere mm -hmm. or, or the atmosphere of, a, of another world. Okay. And, and traveling from, say, a distance as the moon. Mm -hmm. I mean, this was a unique problem for when you're sending something really far away and it's coming, coming back, back at a much really faster fast. speed. Right, okay. right, right. 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 We, we have an image, don't we, of what they would see yeah. taking high-speed photos of that, I think. Tell us what that's all about. So you're looking at a, um, an image of the shock wave that's coming off of that little tiny model as it goes down uh, down the tube. And in this image, the, the capsule's traveling from right to left, right? So um, as it comes into the atmosphere, this shock wave is created. And we talked earlier about how this blunt shape on the end of the capsule protects it from the heat. And here you can see it actually is making this layer, the shock wave is making a layer around the capsule that, that's protecting it from um, the heat generated by friction as it comes into the atmosphere. And so it's an mm -hmm. amazing photo to yeah. see. Uh, you can, you know, this was this was, you know, back in the you know pre-digital age, and so they had uh, you know, cameras set up down the tunnel um, to snap pictures as 
as the thing was flying down it. Amazing. That is amazing. We actually mm-hmm. have a comment here from Quartz saying, amazing how far we have come in such a short amount of time. Mm-hmm. Right. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. You think about it, yeah. it really is. Yeah. You know, 50 years is not that long. Yeah. It's not that long and just, you know. Yeah. Old Mortem says, awesome stream, NASA. Thank you. <laughs> Yay. Thanks for watching. Um, I had another comment to share. I'm over the moon for the new moon mission. No, we haven't heard that one before. So are we, Calculate. So are we. (laughs) Excellent. All right. James, did you bring anything else for us? Uh, Yeah, we've got another exciting artifact here. Ah, Kimberly's going to... Kimberly has it. Okay. We can guess what this is. What is is that? Whoa, let me get out of the way here. James is bringing all the cool stuff. It's encased in glass. What is that, James? Tell us what that is. That is a genuine moon rock. Wow. Uh, moon this rock. one That's an was rock. returned by Apollo 15 and uh, weighs uh, under a pound, mm. about 0.3 pounds. Um, and it's still like, I don't know, I, I get shivers every time I see it. It's, it's, it's so weird just to, to wrap your mind around. Uh, that rock's been a long way. Right? Yeah. yeah. Right. It's 3.4 right. billion years old. Mm-hmm. Wow. I mean, that's kind of the age of the first life crawling out of the ocean. Here on Earth, of, yeah. According to current understanding. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, the, the moon is this treasure trove of science. The moon preserves the ancient history of the, of the solar system. And... Uh, even today, researchers apply to NASA all over the world to look at samples of the Apollo moon rocks. Mm. Oh, yeah. Um, wow. And it's still, so we're still uh, learning new new things. Wow. I love it, that in a way it kind of just looks like a rock because that just <laughs> reminds me that these objects and places in space are part of our solar system, right. you know, just like Earth and what well, what are the things the that I'm noticing that I don't know comes across on the on the video, right? Is it kind of sparkles? It does. It sparkles. Yeah, it's got these, I was yeah. Say yeah. It's little reflection. <laughs> um, yeah. And and I, I I'm looking at the monitor in the studio, and I, I'm not sure that that really comes across. It is it is not just this gray lump that it appears like. There's some really neat stuff going on that that just kind of brings it brings it well. I was going to say brings it to life, but that's not quite the <laughs> <life>. <laughs> not really far the right from term. that. <laughs> but at the time, back in the 1960s um we didn't know whether Mm -hmm. life was on other worlds and it's still a quest that nasa and the humanity is looking for are we alone yeah yeah Yeah. Yeah. and when the apollo samples were returned ames was one of two nasa centers uh, that actually analyzed uh, the samples and looked for uh, whether or not uh, they actually had life Uh, or signs of life that's so cool i didn't know that and how did they how did they do it I think we actually have some footage of this. We do, yeah. yeah uh, here in our archives. Tell us uh, story, yeah. Yeah, so um, from our archives here uh, at Ames, there's some uh, recently rediscovered footage. We're seeing it here now. Mm-hmm. Um, what's going on here, Kimberly? What are we. Oh, so um, this is Apollo 11 soil samples that brought to the Ames Lunar Biological Laboratory. And they're being held in a sterile condition of these um, glove boxes in a clean room. And you see Petri dishes. And what they're trying to do is see if life grows on the lunar samples. And um, they're mimicking conditions for which life has been known to grow on Earth, um, bacteria, microbes, and the like, mm. and, um, and looking at it through a microscope. And, uh, uh, you know, it's it's uh, a very dedicated, systematic study, and it f- laid the groundwork for the beginning of what we call astrobiology. At the time, it was called exobiology, the study of the search for life um, elsewhere in the universe, and the study of the origin of life here. Wow! And um, the techniques here, you know, they they learned that the um, the uh, the lunar sy- samples did not have life, but they didn't know it at the time until they'd done the experiments. Right, mm-hmm. right. You had to check, right? Yeah. It even so still laying the foundation for more science yeah. research. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. The, yeah. the techniques more. and that, you know that techniques and other techniques looking for amino acids and mm-hmm. um, carbon compounds and you know the, the stuff of the, life. The, the stuff of, of life yeah. led to the development of the uh, instruments that flew on Viking that went to Mars in 1976 to look oh. for life on Mars, and then you know. Uh, several packages that we're also exploring life you know on other places in our solar system because our Mm -hmm. knowledge of the solar system today is way different Mm -hmm. it's a much beautiful more diverse solar system than 
the scientists back in the 60s could have ever imagined because we've uh. been sending all these robotic explorers over the last couple of decades out to Pluto, um, out through the giant planets, the moons of the giant planets. It is an ex amazing place to explore. We're still cool. looking today. And we're yeah. still looking, and yeah. we have yet to find, you know, our life on this pale blue dot, our blue oasis world here is still one of a kind. Yeah. yeah. Still looking, yeah. though. Yeah, more to come, you know. Yeah. <laughs> Always more to look yeah. forward to. <laughs> Yes. Um, I have a few moon rock questions. Maybe we could take these as like rapid fire. <laughs> okay. Um, first of all, what is the difference between moon rocks and earth rocks? And to go with that, are moon rocks more porous compared to the rocks on earth? Or are they just about the same? Anybody um, know? It's a, it's a range. So short answer. Uh, the rocks on the moon are very similar to that on, on Earth. So we have igneous that were made in a volcano. We have um, metamorphic that were made with high temperatures and high pressures. We have not quite sedimentary, which were made on the Earth with wind and water. On the moon, they're called breccias. They're, they're shocked. So we have slightly different types. The moon, on average, is lighter in terms of its its rocks than the Earth, it's less dense. Oh. Um, this can lead to another discussion of how the Earth and Moon form. <laughs> so they're very similar, um, but they're slightly also different. But they're made of the same things. We're all made out of stardust, essentially, yeah. you know, yeah. at the end of the day. Nice, perfect. Um, history question for James before you have to go. Yeah. Uh, do the original mission control computers still work? Do you know? Um, the computers themselves, um, Images of them have been used uh, to recreate uh, the mission control oh, uh, yeah. room in uh, in Houston, oh. and uh, I would actually have to have to check, um, but I know that the the recreation that was done some of the some of the material in there is original, and other stuff was actually just uh, sourced on eBay. So the the coffee pots, <laughs> the cigarette, you know, oh. the, the, the ashtrays, <laughs> all of that stuff to to really give um, the feel of mm -hmm. what mission mm -hmm. control uh, was like during that time. And uh, the flight director Gene Kranz, when he went in just a few weeks ago and saw this installation. Uh, I think he made the comment it was something like he could hear the voices mm. of all the controllers at their computer stations, at right. their monitors. Um, that recreation was so spot mm -hmm. on oh. that it just brought back um, this, this, this really intense moment yeah. of, of a memory that, you know, um, how could you not forget? So they really got it right. Wow. Yeah. 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 Oh, beautiful. Yeah. Excellent. <laughs> One last comment before the moon rock has to go away. Emergem, Emergem, not sure. Mm -hmm. Moon rock. <laughs> yeah. That's a good comment. I agree. I yeah. agree. <laughs> and more moon rocks are coming. Even though we're still That's have a lot. Of, you're still studying right. the, uh, the. There's been samples that have been kept in, um, have not been touched in 47, 50 years mm -hmm. that are being looked at researchers say, because our yeah. laboratory equipment today is much more sophisticated and advanced. So mm -hmm. I'm thanking the scientists of the previous generation who left this gift to us today so that yeah. we can continue our, our search of knowledge. And when we get even different moon rocks from different places of the moon, yes. we will be able to answer some pretty tough questions that we haven't been able to answer. The moon rocks gave us a huge leap and understanding, and we're still being studied today. That's awesome. Amazing. Like time capsule. Yeah. Right? Time capsule. Yeah. I think there are teams at Ames that are going to study those mm -hmm. samples, so we'll be able to provide an update yes. sometime yes. in the future. Yeah. Fun times. Yeah. 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 Well, thank you, James, for joining Great. us. Thank you, folks. And Thanks, taking James. us down memory lane with the history. Yeah. Take care. <laughs> okay. We'll see you another time. Yeah. <laughs> And uh, you all, don't forget to join us in celebrating the 50th anniversary of the Apollo 11 moon landing and hear about our future plans to go forward to the moon and on to Mars by tuning in into a t to a special two-hour live NASA television broadcast tomorrow at 10 a.m. Pacific time. Learn more about the show and how to watch by going to www.nasa.gov forward slash Apollo 40th, and don't forget to click on events. Apollo 50th, in fact, but... Ah, did I say 40th? <laughs> yes, yes, I meant 50th. <laughs> of course, of course. We're all mixed up. Just, just add 10, whatever no, Tiffany yeah, says. Yeah, plus 10. <laughs> <laughs> plus 10, exactly. So, yeah, let's talk so. about our uh, next giant leap. Artemis. Yes, Artemis. So, what what is Artemis? Well, Why do we call it Mar Artemis? So Ar Artemis was uh, Apollo's twin sister, mm. right? So it's if you know your Greek mythology, you know, mythology, 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 mythology there. Because if it's Latin mythology, it's Diana, but it's Greek mythology uh, is Artemis. Artemis. <laughs> yep. Kimberly with the fun facts, Yay, man. What <laughs> I like the 
love words. See, they're evocative. I mean, she's yeah. the goddess of the moon. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's very appropriate. And yeah. uh, and also with the Artemis charge, we're going to place the first woman on the moon. Yes. Uh, right. With the next crew to go to the moon. Yes. And um, an amazing leap for womankind. <laughs> yes. And humankind. And Absolutely. It's, it's about time. Uh, <laughs> exactly. You know there are young women out there, students, young girls who are like, Watch out, Moon! Yeah, we're coming for you. And since we're having our Artemis as a sustainable lunar exploration program, it's just different than Apollo. Apollo was like a road trip. I mean, it did an amazing things. It, <laughs> it was road trip to the Moon. No, it was, it was a huge engineering challenge just to even conceive going from suborbital flight to going to the Moon and back in less than 10 years mm-hmm. and to build that whole infrastructure with a very elegant but complicated mm-hmm. logistical solution was immense. I mean, Artemis is different. We're doing not doing it alone. It's no longer the realm of governments and superpowers. It's mm-hmm. a different era. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we have yeah. commercial and international partners, sustainable presence, um, and you know, in the pursuit of knowledge, in the pursuit of innovation, with opportunities for economic and you know more spinoffs. You know, the Apollo yeah. program gave us a lot of spinoffs, what we call things that we use today as a result of the, the research, the, and the research and the engineering, engineering. technology mm-hmm. development that was well, done. And, and it's not mm-hmm. just to go, right? The right. objective of Apollo was to go to mm-hmm. the moon and safely Come. return. Right. But, mm-hmm. but that was that was the objective, yeah. right? With Artemis, it's to have a longer term sustained presence. Mm-hmm. And of course, it's the path to Mars, which is the next giant leap. And, to go to and Mars. so the, it's fu- as Kim Burley said, it's fundamentally a different approach to than Apollo was. You know, okay, it's the same basic destination, but uh, we're not going to land directly on the moon. We're going to the gateway first, that will be orbiting uh, an orbiting space station around the moon, and then going down to the surface from gateway, um, we're going to the South Pole, um, which is a, a very different place in many respects, more challenging than where Apollo was landing. Um, so there's many fascinating different things that are going into Artemis that um, were really never um, something that was even approachable mm. back in the Apollo era. Yeah. It's, a, it's a big big stretch from where we were at with Apollo. Uh, and of course, we have this longer objective then of taking what we learn mm-hmm. from the moon portion and taking that with us to Mars. Nice summary. Lots of challenges. <laughs> there, there are a bunch of questions that we'll get to about the goals and what's different. Stuff, mm-hmm. And I think you just gave a good overview to yeah. get us well, started. Of, of course, a, a, a huge part um, and really kind of the first and biggest step for Artemis, right, is how do you, how do you launch? How do you get there? Yeah. Right? We're talking about carrying a lot of material. We talked earlier about the Saturn V. Yes. Well, the, bi- the, the big, big rocket for Artemis is the Space Launch System SLS. Ah, right? yes. And yeah. SLS is, if you thought Saturn V was impressive, SLS is even more impressive. You can see some video of it here. Um, an so, animation. An animation. Yeah. Yeah, so, an animation so the, SLS, the, the rockets and the, the engines are already being under a lot of tests right now. Right, and a lot of this is um, um, materials that we learned from doing the space shuttle missions. Um, so it's a little bit shorter than the Saturn V. It's 322 feet tall. Saturn V was 363 feet, so it's 41 feet shorter. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's that's also a lot bigger than the space shuttle, which is the one we're used to flying, right? The shuttle was huge, and it's only 184 feet tall. <laughs> ah. So this is, as we said earlier, Saturn V is taller than the Statue of Liberty, and Right, so is SLS. Right, mm-hmm. it's it's almost twenty it's a big feet rocket. tall. It's going to be, okay. it's gonna be yeah. when when we have it flying. It's going to be the biggest rocket ever yep. built. Wow! wow. So and it's capability to even take payloads to Saturn and Jupiter. Yep. I mean, this oh, is a wow. very capable machine. We t- we mm-hmm. talked about it's how much um, how much thrust and how much payload the Saturn V had, mm-hmm. and SLS is over a million pounds of thrust more powerful. Oh wow! wow. Right, so the SLS can deliver more cargo to the moon than the shuttle could take to low Earth orbit. Oh, wow. So that's, wow. that's just a, yeah. an enormous capability. Right? And as Kimberly noted, it take, takes us to lots of other destinations in the future. Yeah. More so capability. Th- so this is a huge capability. It's a unique capability. It's not something you need to put satellites into orbit, for mm-hmm. example. No, it's for something right? it's, more. Yeah. It's really for this unique, this very unique mission. Awesome. Very cool. Yeah. Um, 
you have a- we have a comment here from King's Throne. When there are astronauts on the moon, I will stand and wave at the moon at a, at the full moon. I hope they wave back. Oh, <laughs> I'm sure they'll be waving back. Yeah, I'll join you. Elizabeth <laughs> Artemis, if I get my wish, I want to land astronauts on the far side of the moon because we haven't been there yet. Ah. <laughs> In fact, Apollo only may have only gone to about four percent of the surface of the moon. There's a lot of Terra, sorry, Luna incognita. <laughs> to channel my Latin, um, that we the unknown territories on the moon that we yeah. haven't seen. We also have not yet been to the South Pole, right? Right, which is the first poles. destination for <laughs> Artemis. Right. Mm -hmm. And to remind everyone what exactly we're counting down up here, <laughs> this is the time until 2024 when the Artemis mission will land people on at the, at the South Pole of the moon, right? There is a question. Someone was asking what's special about the Lunar yeah. South Pole. Could you tell us quickly what we might? Oh, yeah. You know, um, just in the last 10 years, um, our understanding of the moon uh, flipped itself on the head, and we learned that there's water on the moon. I mean, of the uh. Apollo generation, they thought the moon was bone dry. Turns out mm -hmm. there is actually water moons actually all over the moon. There's different sources, but the poles seem to have large quantities of water. Now, we should, we should know this is not liquid water, correct? It's, it's, yeah. it's, it's frozen water yeah. and water in different, uh, yeah, frozen and water. Crystals like, in the soil, crystals right? Crystals in the soil. Mm -hmm. And so um, it's scientifically interesting because um, it shouldn't have been there. And why is it there? We'd mm -hmm. like to know why it's there and Intriguing. where it is. <laughs> um, but as from a human exploration, it's uh, water's H2O. It can be used for hydrogen and oxygen for fuel, um, oxygen to to breathe, um, so the pole going to the poles is a step in uh, human exploration using resources off the land, and the same techniques we'd use to harvest the moon water, mm. similar to what we do on Mars, because we know Mars has subsurface frozen water as well. Okay, so perfect yep. training ground. I mean, that, that's the big reason. To, that's the big reason to go there. to the South Pole. South Pole is hard because you know. Um, it's it's in a lot more shadow, right? The sunlight mm -hmm. is a much lower angle, um, so you have to really think about how you build your mission much more carefully. Um, how do you generate electricity? How do you stay warm? Uh, yeah. There's a, a whole new set of challenges yeah. that we're, we really didn't have to worry too much about uh, in the Apollo mission. Uh, and, and the, the, artists, and like the Artemis things. And we like <laughs> hard stuff. <laughs> hard stuff. Easy. Yeah. Yeah. And we do things because not because they're easy, <laughs> because they're hard. Yes. And the Artemis program will have uh, humans on the moon for weeks at a time initially, and mm -hmm. cul culminating to months at a time. I mean, this is also different than Apollo. Mm -hmm. Apollo was, you know, Apollo 11 was two and a half hours on the surface. Right. 21 hours yeah. just there on the surface, 20, two and a half hours walking around. Um, we most went up to three days on the surface. So. Uh, this is a very different um, approach to being off-world for long periods of time and how you do that from an engineering solution, your power, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. your fuel, your water, your air, your energy, All these um, the temperature, extremes you'll experience. Uh, they all can be overcome, and they all be, and the solutions are going to be amazing. Yeah. Excellent. Yeah. You answered a question from Pi Day. What are some new difficulties with Artemis that were not present during the Apollo missions? Yeah, long yeah. duration, long yeah. duration. Yeah. And that, that's maybe one of the biggest ones is we are sending humans out there for much longer periods of time, um, and they're beyond the the shielding from radiation that's afforded mm -hmm. by Earth's magnetosphere. So when astronauts are on the International Space Station for long periods of time, right, up, up to a year as the record, um, that, that's a challenging environment, but it doesn't uh, have the same degree of exposure to radiation that going out away from Earth has. And so that's I don't know, one of the big hurdles yeah, to so, overcome. So NASA is going to need a lot of uh, uh, doctors and mm -hmm. biologists and people who study the human physiology to work on mitigation and also to help with how humans, the fragilist point of long duration space, to, you know, space yeah. exploration, exploration yeah. and mm -hmm. how the human body behaves mm -hmm. and reacts and recovers. Yeah. Yeah. From a, a that's very fascinating too. Right. Some, but it's going to happen at Mars too. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah. Um, this question from uh, Sleepy underscore Gary, um, some of your answers already answered his question. Uh, what are the main scientific goals of the Artemis moon mission? And answering those questions are scientific and kind of also are things that we want to, you know, find out, right? Those are our goals. Yeah, scientifically, I mean, some of the biggest unanswered questions, even after processing the wonderful lunar samples from Apollo, mm -hmm. um, we still... Um, don't really know what happened during the early phases of the early times of our solar system because um, the rock samples that we have um, might have uh, have a bias in it. They might not have been sampling some of the oldest places on the moon. So okay. looking for older rocks. 
um, how the moon's interior looks like, we would like to have samples of the moon from the mantle, something below the crust. Oh yeah. Um, that that will take service the going to different parts of the moon where we can actually get to the mantle, and perhaps we can understand how that moon formed and how it cooled. Um, and uh, the moon also um, p- potentially could tell us what happened with our early sun. We're interested in oh. how the sun behaved during the early solar system, and this can help us understand extra solar planet systems where we're looking at planets around other stars today. You know, there are more planets and stars out there. Mm-hmm. So our view of the Amazing. universe is changing, and we have our solar system in our backyard here. The moon has, um, uh, has the answers to some of these questions. Awesome. Yeah. The early phases there's, of a, there's also the basic science around you know human physiology, right? Which is as we said, you know, how how does the human body respond to radiation exposure to you know long term deprivation of gravity? Uh, all these things, uh, I mean, those those are really basic questions that are they're important for our eventual journey to Mars, but they're also you know the the just the basic knowledge that's often really helpful in unexpected ways for improving life on Earth. Mm-hmm. And as an yeah. astrophysicist, I would be amiss if I didn't say I'm gonna would love to put a telescope on the far side of the moon. Ooh, yeah. <laughs> and it would open up a different range of the electromagnetic spectrum that we have not explored before because oh, wow. it shields from the radio emissions from the Earth. So oh. it becomes a new window into the universe just right oh, in our backyard because cool. the far side is, is, is facing away from us. And we could make it really big. Oh, <laughs> really, really, really big. Nice. <laughs> Maybe you'll get your telescope. I might really, get my telescope on the far side of the moon. <laughs> nice. Uh, speaking of human bodies, what kind of spacesuits should be used? Big and bulky, but safe, or small, tight, but flexible? Do you there's guys, that, there's do you guys actually know? been some really exciting work uh, done exactly in this area. Wow. Um, and th- there's a, a number of different designs that are still being considered, but they kind of uh, hit both ends of that spectrum, right? Some, some of them look like the more traditional, a little bulkier suit because it off- offers a lot of protection from mm. the environment. Some of them are a little more streamlined and sleeker uh, because they're just easier to walk around in and do things um, and get stuff done, uh, and they just they just don't weigh as much. Uh, but I think the jury's still out as to which is the preferred one right now. There, mm-hmm. It's uh, an area of ongoing research and development. Yeah, there's a cool mm-hmm. idea of a particular design of one of the landers on the moon to deal with the lunar dust, which is a kind of a hazard. It's this glass-like because there's no wind oh. or water on the moon, flowing water to... To smooth it out, hmm. and one of them has you sort of you're in your your spacesuit, and you go in and you leave your face spacesuit on the outside. Oh, you know, you kind okay. of de de cloak or something, and then yeah. you, therefore the dust doesn't get into your habitat. It never comes in. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I like that idea. There's basically a, an, there's so many different creative there's ideas. There's basically a hatch so on the back of the yeah. spacesuit that docks oh, yeah. to the, the to docks. The, yeah, and, and so your <laughs> suit always stays on the outside, where all so all the dirt, all the contaminants stay oh, cool. yeah. out there. So there's there's great. and there's a lot of work ahead. I mean, you're, you're gonna when you're on the surface doing things, you're gonna learn. Oh, like the, like the Apollo astronauts learned, to, they're gonna skip and hop to get maneuvering with that bulky things. Mm. Um, the Artemis astronauts are going to find new things with their spacesuits and what things to change. Oh, I mm-hmm. can't drill as much. I can't climb. I can't, you know, rappel down the crater in mm-hmm. as yeah. easiest way as I'd like, you oh, know. Yeah. So there's there's going to be a lot of s- different suit designs for the applications it mm-hmm. needs. And so we need those we need those solutions and we need to, while we we'll learn those as we explore more. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Always learning. Always yeah. learning. <laughs> Always learning. Very good. Uh, do you have a question in mind? I think I do. Um, well, we have one here for Chad. Uh, it's and it's about the SLS. So why uh, why are we um, designing a new system to get to the moon and not just use the same Apollo equipment that we used last time? Yeah. Well, it's so a good like, question. Do you um, maybe want to tell everybody the, what the full system? consists of we talked about sls mm-hmm. well right. i mean that, then there's i think that's the the main one we're talking about but there's also you know the equivalent to all the apollo vehicles that kimberly was showing with the little props right there's a there's a command module which now is the orion there's an equivalent to the service module which actually the europeans are providing mm-hmm. there's a you know a lunar vehicle um that uh, will be you know putting the humans down on the moon um what's Different this time from Apollo is we also have the Gateway, uh, which is an orbiting space station around the moon, um, and of course the big, the big rocket. So the question is, why don't we just use what we had in the Apollo era? Well, in principle, you you could use those designs, right? But for one thing, we'd like to carry um, additional people, and the Apollo capsule is only big enough to carry three. We'd really like to carry four. Um, 
We have some video footage of the Orion well, capsule. Why, why don't we, we can yes. run that? Um, maybe I'll, I'll talk while we go, right? And you could you could see it's pretty good size. Uh, one of the other reasons is that. Um, all those designs haven't been produced for 50 years. And so to go back and recover the design, recover the tooling, um, it's basically as big a job as making a new one. Hmm. Right? Yeah, wow. there's, a, there's a story about how um, Ames participated in a 21st century detective story on the re-entry, the thermal uh, the tiles on the bottom of the, the Apollo, thermal protection, the thermal system. protection mm -hmm. system of the, the Apollo capsules. They were mm -hmm. made of a, a chemical thing called Avcoat. And ah. they had to re-engineer the chemical formula, and a oh. 21st century version of that is on the oh, Orion okay. capsule. So yeah. we we thank the, we thank the Apollo engineers right. for providing that groundwork, mm -hmm. and uh, we're using that the research that we're so the, still mm -hmm. using. The mm -hmm. learning, the ideas, uh, if not the actual specific designs, are carried along Carry in on. the new program, and. A, you know, a lot of the elements of this program have actually been in development now for you know, more than 10 years. Mm -hmm. So we're not starting from scratch today. Uh, this, this has been in development for some time. Uh, but a lot of the times if, if you want to take literally the old design and reuse it, it, it can be just as much work as doing a clean sheet of paper. Mm -hmm. And doing the new design also allows you to bring you know, all our latest and greatest technology and ideas, um, which can make things lighter, uh, more cost effective, and in many cases a lot safer. So we're always mm -hmm. looking at, at those things as we come up with new new pieces. I mean even the um, Orion capsule that we were just looking at, it's essentially Apollo on steroids because it has an, an incredible amount of computing power that mm. oh, the yeah. Apollo capsule did not have. That makes sense. And it can yeah. carry a lot more payload and it is uh, supports more astronauts for very long durations in space. It's a very mm -hmm. different um, mm -hmm. design. Yeah, as, as, the, similar, as similar as the Artemis program is to Apollo in that we're going to the moon, a lot of it ends right there because the, the basic requirements for what it has to do, for how long it has to go, for how many people it's going to carry are all different from Apollo, right, right. which leads you to you know, somewhat different solutions in the design. Makes sense, makes sense. So we have the SLS rocket, we have the Orion spacecraft, and then we have Gateway. Yeah. Should we talk a little more about Gateway? Gateway's going to be my next favorite species. <laughs> I, I, I can't I wait for Gateway. I, I, I think it is fascinating. <laughs> I, 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 it's, uh, it's designed in mind to be essentially our first interplanetary space tug. You know, it's a spaceship that could have would have the capability of allowing us to maneuver things in space mm -hmm. and propelling um, other vehicles to Mars. Um, but it is a um, orbiting uh, ship around the moon. It gets as close to a thousand miles of the moon surface, and it goes as far away as forty thousand miles. It's in this uh, rectilinear um, yeah. orbit. It allows you to land on any place on the on the moon. Wow! Which we didn't have with Apollo. Wow. Apollo, the the orbit trajectory was you know on a specific place could only hand, land on the equator. This allows us to go to the poles, which we were talking about earlier. It allows us to go to the mm -hmm. far side. Um, but it has a very unique uh, propulsion on it. It's solar electric propulsion, and it's more powerful than anything of that type that we've seen before. And that's cool. the type of propulsion we're going to need when we're far from home, like on our journey to Mars. Right. Cool. And so that's going to be used. And I also love the fact that it's open architecture. Ah. All the ports are going to be made available online because we want... Uh, it's going to have commercial and international partners docking, yeah, you know, I, coming and yeah. going, and having humans on it and not having humans on it. It's going to be uh, a vacation home type thing. <laughs> you know, the astronauts will be there for a few weeks or a month at a time, and then mm -hmm. then they'll be empty for some time. And um, it really is a way, a different approach to thinking about long term human exploration in space. It's kind of like a space condo. Yeah, space space condo. Condo. <laughs> I like space condo. I like yeah. that. <laughs> we're, we're going. It's kind of an outpost, a staging place. Yeah. Uh, we hang out there hang for out. a while, and then then we leave. Yeah. And then you know, then we'll come back later, and we'll pick back up, and, and we'll do got, things. It's got this propulsion to be a tugboat. It also allows us to put um, biological ex or other science experiments mm -hmm. on it. I'll put a telescope on it. Why not? Yeah, yeah. Yes. <laughs> Throw it in there. Uh, control the rovers on the surface from it. I mean, yeah, yeah. yeah. I think awesome. it's got a lot of potential. I think we actually Great. have an animation of Gateway to show. Oh, yeah. We do. Yep, there we yeah. go. This is showing all the different component modules uh, from both commercial and international partners, as well as NASA, being assembled to form, you know, eventually this this really functional uh, outpost in orbit around the moon. Um, 
And it also allows us to have constant communication with Earth, which again is, you know, something you won't have when you go to Mars, but at least this time, mm-hmm. while we're working out all the interesting challenges of being away from planet Earth and being in this um, environment for long periods of time, um, it truly is a proving ground. And uh, it's, it's flexible in terms of what it can be used for. Awesome. Yeah. You guys answered a question from, uh, oh gosh, I've lost it. Yoga Fire. Is Artemis a joint venture the way that the International Space Station is international? And you talked about yeah, very, very yeah. much so. Partners. Yeah. Yep. yeah. And, and more partners as well. The International mm-hmm. Space Station is, has about 15 partners. Wow. I mean, now we have 89 nations on this planet that have satellites in orbit. We oh, are wow. a very different species than we mm-hmm. were we're years in. ago. Yeah. So, as um, you know, uh, the future of space is for the whole world, and we have a lot of nations, you know, working in space in terms of their economics or their communication, um, and they'll be partnering with, you know, this is what this um, the Artemis program is about. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Outstanding. Uh, we have a question here from an Easter egg. Uh, is Gateway bigger than the ISS? No, no. It's uh, I, ISS is really huge, um, and, and Gateway, because it's so much further away, is going to be a, a much more compact uh, vehicle, mm. um, you know, it'll it'll have a lot of the functionality that ISS does, just be you know a little smaller, well, a lot smaller. Well, it's just still need to be occupied. Not so the ISS, an amazing achievement, has been continuously occupied for almost twenty years. Mm-hmm. November of two thousand was the the first occupants. That's and, crazy. Uh, People uh, in space, yeah. and um, you know, it's designed years. for that reason. So, our, uh, so Gateway is going to be designed differently because it mm-hmm. has to be able to support humans for periods of time and then periods where it doesn't have humans. Okay, um, yeah. And so, um, uh, that can be done because of our advancements in robotics mm-hmm. and autonomy mm-hmm. and smart software. I mean. I know it's a different vehicle, but you know we're starting to see self-driving cars, self-driving trucks. Our yeah. satellites are a lot more autonomous. We are a smarter species now, and uh, now space can take advantage of the knowledge that we've gained in that field. As well. wow. Awesome. Yeah. I think we have time for like one more question. Yeah. And then we really one have more. to go. Well, the yeah. questions are the best. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Maybe this one from a random clown. What are some of the design challenges that have yet to be solved for this trip? Can you identify? Well, there's so many. I'm sure yeah. there are many. <laughs> there's a lot of work to do. Yeah. I mean, if you just think about it, we were just talking about Apollo earlier in this, this show. When the charge came to go to the moon hmm. in 61, it was only 20 days after they had done a first suborbital flight. They hadn't even done an orbital flight. They hadn't figured out how to do rendezvous to spacecraft. That had been a lot of... They hadn't done a spacewalk. They didn't even have a space suit. They wow. didn't have... <laughs> um, they didn't have to do We're in, a much better, we're in a much better place today. <laughs> but there, there will be challenges. No, no doubt about it. There'll be, new, and that's the beauty of it. Because when you have a problem that has not been solved, that's when you get your creative hmm. new solutions. Right. You know, yeah, yeah. you're going to attack a problem and come back with something that no one's ever thought of before. Yeah. And then who knows where that's going to be? Oh. Lead us. Nicely said. Yeah. <laughs> Well, I guess we can, that's the perfect way to end this, huh? It is, <laughs> on that note. Um, that's about all the time we have today, you guys. A huge thanks to our guests and everyone who joined us in the chat today on Twitch. Uh, we will be back on Thursday, July 25th, talking about how to get an internship at NASA. That's how it starts. <laughs> that's right. That's right. There are a lot of people here today who started yeah. as interns, right? Yeah. So that's our next show for this gang here. But remember to join us tomorrow in celebrating the Apollo 50th and hearing about more about our future plans to go to the moon and on to Mars. So tune in to our special two-hour live NASA television broadcast tomorrow at 10 a.m. Pacific. And you can learn more about the show and how to watch it by going to www.nasa.gov slash Apollo 50th and click on events. So check it out, and we'll see you soon. Thanks for joining us. Bye. Bye.